Yes, I am going to talk about a very awkward subject and might make people angry with me. How long have you been working on that book? But we'll talk about it, and I should be writing number 59, season 17. Well, I should be writing. Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is the podcast for wannabe fiction writers. It is live streamed on Twitch Tuesdays and Thursdays and then ends up in the RSS feed over at merverse.com or wherever you find podcasts. There are a lot of places to find podcasts and I'm pretty sure I Should Be Writing is found at most of them. So about me, I am... Uh, I took a lot of time off last week because I was, I finished a project and apparently I needed it. It's like I would keep getting up and the days would just kind of slip away and my brain needed a hard reboot. So, um, yeah, we're going to be busy for the first two weeks of September and I'm a little stressed out about it, but, uh, we'll still be podcasting here and recording streaming, all those, all those words. So, uh, but what I'm working on is I finally, uh, I mentioned last week that I turned in my novella and then I already got comments back and I sat on those for a little while so I could distance myself a little bit. And, um, then I've been working on them today and I've gotten 35 pages into an 84 page document. So I could finish this today. Now granted I have a stream and then I've got a couple of other things going on, so it might be tomorrow, but but soon. I'm very excited about this because the edits are not nearly as intense as the previous ones asked for, so I think I'm on the right track. So that's very exciting for me. And uh, that's pretty much my good news. Uh, other part of good news, I finally listened to Godmaker on the Zombies Run app, and I'm always the person who's afraid to go and look at my published stuff because I'm going to find a whole bunch of stuff that I wish I could have changed or realize it wasn't as good as I thought it was. You know, it's just like, just fears, just fears cropping up all over the place. And um, I went for a run yesterday and pulled up Godmaker episode one and I loved it. It was, uh, it feels like a different project to me because... I had nothing to do with the um, voice casting or any of the uh, any of the sound effects, and so while I know the plot points, it, it doesn't even sound. I mean, I know it's my dialogue. It's not like they changed a whole bunch of stuff, but it doesn't sound like my dialogue because I don't hear it in my head. I hear it in my head very differently than I hear the voice actors perform it, and. It was enough of a distancing that I um, I really enjoyed it, and they just do so much good work over there. It's the Zombies Run app, and Zombies Run has gone far, far beyond doing plots that run away from zombies, uh, while those plots are intricate and amazing as well. They have a lot of adventure races, which have all sorts of different topics, and so I sent them my weird dark fantasy idea about a woman who carves gods out of bone and lives on, you know, north of a necropolis and yeah, stuff happens. Uh, this is an idea I've wanted to write for years and years and years and I could never find the right media medium for it. So I pitched, you know, I, my agent wasn't really hot on it and I think she tried to sell it. I can't remember. Anyway, it didn't sell, obviously. So when it when uh, Six to Start was asking for adventure ideas, I pitched it to them as an adventure run. So uh, if if you're interested and don't want to spend any money, you can download Zombies Run and listen to the first two episodes for free. It's called Godmaker, and it's I'm really happy with it. So uh, 
Yeah, tooting my own horn. It's it's it actually the I thought Godmaker was good enough to give me back a little of my confidence because I've it's been flagging well for the whole pandemic. So uh, yay for that. But I also like to talk to y'all about your good news. If anybody has any, if you would like to put it in the chat, if you're here now, and if you're listening to this later and you really have something you want to tell me about, a book sale, a story sale, a positive rejection, your first rejection, we celebrate all of those things because those are all things that happen to professional writers. And you can email me and tell me that you have good news for the next show and I will... uh, Push the yay button for you. Oh no, Sam sprained his ankle. You were looking forward to running to Godmaker. I'm so sorry. Take care of that ankle. Take care of it. So uh, we're getting some good news coming in here. We got um, Meerkat got second rejection. That is, uh, that's hardcore Meerkat because as we all know, I'm not such, I'm not 100% Pollyanna. Rejections do suck, but a lot of times people will get their first rejection and think, oh God, that sucked, it hurt, I'm never doing it again, and you didn't do that. Uh, Southpaw's children are back in school. I hope that they remain safe, but it's got to be nice having a little bit of uh, reality routine coming back after so much time. So yeah, I, I, I'm worried about schools and children and all sorts of stuff, but I'm ready, ready, so ready for this to be over. Oh God. Uh, and you know, I think about, I think fondly of this time last year when I'm thinking, I am so ready for this to be over. Yes. So let's bring us all down, Mer. Let's talk about the hur- hurricane too. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, my thoughts are with people in Louisiana. And I'm not sure about how everybody else is doing, but I know it's moved on to Mississippi and into Tennessee. So I hope everyone's doing well in that path. Schools are practicing safety and I'm dictating lunch hour to writing. Dedicating to lunch hour to writing. Those are all, uh, yeah, yeah, safety and writing. All good. So I forgot to say it at the beginning, but we still have a sponsor. There's still a Scribophile, and I still want to read how awesome they are. I'm just very happy that Scribophile is a sponsor because they offer what people have been asking me about for years, which is a community to follow when you want to find beta readers or you want to find a writer's group or just someone to read a chapter or someone to follow you through your book and critique it as it goes. You can find a good group of people there. Um, It's got a free version and a paid version. And it just looks like a really, really great community. Uh, Once you've run your work through Scribophile, members have often gone on to find agents and get their work published in all kinds of markets, ranging from self-publishing to small indie presses to big five publishers. I am comforted by the fact that They've earned some credibility getting endorsed by NaNoWriMo and Writer's Digest, and they're on several top 100 sites for writers, so I uh, feel comfortable endorsing them. So if you have some, if you've been looking for a writer's group or beta readers, then um, try Scribophile.com. So I was trying to figure out what to talk about today, and the thing that kind of... The thing that kind of came to mind, it's, it's, I hate doing this because I know so many people have good intentions. And when you get an idea, it it just continues to become this amazing, amazing thing. And you think that as you get better as a writer, you will continue to make that one book better. I I really doubt this person listens to me and I feel very bad, but I, I need to use them as an example. When I was um, at my very first residency at Stone Coast, 
maybe my second one, doesn't matter. I was in a workshop with someone who had, who was on their last residency or their second to last. Also doesn't matter. Much further along than I was. And they were running through the, uh, running through the another chapter edit. And I was told that they'd been working on the same project and workshopping it since they started. And that was over two years that they were doing. And they even had, we had strict rules in the MFA program. Uh, a lot of it is you will have your story discussed among everybody at the table. And then the author can ask questions or whatever to, to get some information or ask you to clarify something. And we talked about this thing for like 15, 20 minutes. And the woman sat there and said nothing. And we all discussed the presence of unicorns in this fantasy book and whether they worked or not, or whether they can work at all anymore. And we went on and on and on. That was mostly what we focused on was the unicorn. And when it was her turn to talk, the first comment was, yeah, I've since edited it and the unicorn's out. So while that's funny, it was... When I was in school, I tried to do as many different things that I could. Um, I tried, I wrote some pretty crappy stuff, but I just wanted to try everything. I did a humor workshop and you sh it, it, this res is this MFA program we, we focused in four focus, fo focuses is, yeah, four things to focus on. They were, uh, literature, uh, poetry, creative nonfiction, and popular fiction. It was a very weird Sneetches type group because we were, popular fiction was about the only group that did not regularly cry. I'm not even exaggerating. I'm not making fun of anybody. It's like we just, like creative nonfiction, we're trying to, to get deep in and, and, and get what, like whatever you're writing about and bring you into it. And, and it's gonna be really intense and stuff. And the literature people would just be kind of cranky and just be like, yeah, yeah, they're popular fiction. We're unpopular fiction. And we're like, none of us ever called you that. Just saying. Do you guys are, are, are calling that. Anyway, I took a workshop that was actually cross genre because it was on humor, not any one thing. We were trying to take the concept of humor and put it into our various stories and so I you know I learned a lot from the poet and the creative nonfiction guy clearly had some stuff to work through because basically it was about him trying to make a funny story about the fact that he would paid a lot of money for this MFA program and was not getting a lot out of it it was it was an awkward awkward time big digression I'm sorry it's, it's, I'm just trying to explain how the workshopping went is usually popular fiction would, uh, talk about other popular fiction pieces. And I usually did short stories because unless you've got the same people reading through your manuscript with you, it's hard to give somebody the middle of a book and say, critique this because they're not going to know where it started, they're not going to know if something has been hinted at, or if it's been properly foreshadowed, if there's a, a big reveal, all that stuff. But thinking about this person who'd been workshopping the same fantasy book for years, it made me sad because it, it, it's really like you learn by 
starting a story and finishing a story. And if it sucks, hopefully you'll learn why. But it's really hard to edit something over and over and over again, because at one point you're going to stop even seeing the whole thing. You're just going to see places you want to edit, but you're not going to see the big picture or how it all fits together. You're going to forget what the most recent change is. Because sometimes that's happened to me where I, I have to change a large part of my book and then the editor accepts it. And then because I'd been working with like story A for so long, and then on the last edit, I changed one part of it to story B. I had much more experience with story A. So that's what kind of lodges in my memory and I forget I changed something. I don't know if Preemie has gone through something similar, but it's a, at some point you're just going to be wasting time. And I know that hurts to hear because all of your ideas are good. And, and I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure all your ideas are good, but you get stuck when you just focus on one thing. You're just kind of like in the mud and you're thinking, okay, well, I think I can make this mud nicer. And I think I could like, if I, if I got a bed and I put it over there in that mud and then I build walls around me and then I bring in plumbing that makes mud flow through the house, you know, I, I, I am improving the mud, but it's still mud and I have not worked on maybe building on dirt or sand or concrete. And again, it's, it's, I, I not, I'm not crapping on your story idea. Just 99 times out of a hundred, it's going to be hard to pull off your awesome story idea. So you do what you can and then you move on. Also, when you are so laser focused on one story, then your idea machine is not going to be churning. I mentioned Zay Frank a lot, and Zay Frank, it actually makes me feel old to think about how long ago he did his one video a day. He, he did a video every weekday for a year. It's called Zay Frank the Show. And he's done a lot since. Done a lot of other things. He's done some music. He's done really, really funny YouTube videos. And, you know, he's moved on. But there was so much he talked about during, about, um, creativity and working that they've stuck with me. And every time I realize it was from 2006, I feel very old. But there was one where he, someone says, how do you keep getting new ideas or something? I can't remember exactly what the question was, but I remember he points out, he's like, I get new ideas every day. And the thing is people can get addicted to ideas and they can sit around thinking about the ideas and working on that one idea and not even finishing it because they're still imagining it perfect and beautiful in their heads. And uh, I remember the way Zay Frank said it. He's like, and, and everyone's clapping for them. And if they actually try to write it down, it's not going to be as perfect. And so then the, the shine starts to come off. And he says, people can get addicted. I think he's exaggerating a little bit, but getting addicted to that feeling of, I had a great idea. It's an awesome feeling. Your brain tries to give it to you when you're about 20, 30,000 words in your book. And he's like, I don't want to, he says, I don't, it sits around like brain crack and he doesn't want to, um, get addicted to brain crack. So he does his video, he does his ideas as fast as he gets them. And a lot of his ideas were those ridiculous, but worked on the internet very well kind of things. 
he kept, uh, he wanted to do, let's turn the world into a sandwich. And so, like, I, here in North Carolina, would put a bun or a piece of bread down on the ground and find somebody on the exact other side of the world to put another piece of bread down. And then we've made a world sandwich. He did that and had, like, people sending in all sorts of pictures. Just weird stuff like that. But that was one of his episodes that stuck with me the strongest. Because talking about idea crack and how people are afraid to move on to a new idea. It's possible they think their first idea was a failure. And I don't. I definitely don't believe that. Because everything is a learning experience. And I feel like, like such a jerk saying that. Because I feel like a teacher that forgot how people can get emotionally tied to stories. But, but honestly, Edison said he didn't come up with one way to make light bulbs. He came up with 10,000 ways not to. Sometimes you've got to write to learn what not to do. Sometimes you have to write something that's been in your head forever, and it will suck. But if you write it, it'll get it out of your head. I had an obsession because of a dream I had a while back, many, many, many years ago. And I finally wrote the story, and it sucked. And a friend of mine from the workshop I'd been in, you know, it was all constructive, but basically, he's like, yeah, this isn't good. But I felt great because I got it out of my head. I told the story it wasn't good. I moved on. And because I started a story and I finished a story, something in my head learned something. But when you keep working on the same thing over and over again, you can't, you stop learning. If you have followed my career since early days of podcasting, you know that I did some novellas that proved to be very, very popular. Very popular in mid-aught internet fame. And um, everyone who listened to them loved them. I did a Kickstarter to fund the um, releasing it in ebook and print. And at the time, looking for $2,000 and getting $20,000 was a big success. So that funded very well. The living room was full of books. We had two misprints. So my basement is now full of misprinted book two. Not even the first book. Book two. Yeah, that was fun. And the point is that I wrote it. I was happy with it. People loved it. Agents found me and said, we really need to sell this. This is amazing. I'm like, great. That's exciting. Let's do that. And I rewrote it. I Since it was a series of novellas, I figured I could take uh, do the Tolkien thing and take book one and book two and make it into one novel and then do the same with three and four. But, but the agents couldn't sell it. And I rewrote it for a more young adult uh people i took the took the sex out and that's pretty much all i t took the sex out and i downgraded the characters ages and that didn't work so they asked me to rewrite it again this time for adults again but better than it was before and then i started to get really really disillusioned. I hated that story. I hated it so much. And then I was trying to come up with a, I was trying to come up with a shambling guide to New York City as a novel and sell it. And so I sent it to my agent and she did not like it. She kept using the word brutal. And I'm thinking that's a dog whistle for women shouldn't write bad things. I'm starting to, to, to hear that. Because I... I almost never use triggering, I mean, like, horrific triggering things. I'll, I'll, I'll put, I, I know people could be triggered by bugs or, or birth or something like that, but I'm talking like sexual assault or something. I don't put that in my books. I don't put a lot of violence and gore and bones breaking in my books. And I know there are books out there that do all of that. 
there are YA books out there that do all of that. But my books were brutal. My, my little book about a woman trying to sell a travel book to monsters in New York City. Brutal. Kept saying it. And um, I, she, what she wanted me to do was edit the Heaven series so she could sell it. And I said, they've, I, I've had agents already try that. She's like, yeah, but that was years ago. We're going to try it now. I think I can sell it. And I'm like, are you interested in anything I'm writing right now? Seven years later. She said no. And that's when we parted ways. Because I can't edit that book again. I can't. And I used to joke that if I became, like, Dan Brown famous, I would have to hire someone else if they, like, wanted to go into my backlist and grab, like, Playing for Keeps and the Afterlife series and put them out because the Merle Lafferty name is so hot. But, um, I really, I, I just physically, mentally, emotionally, I can't edit that story again. I'm just making it worse and worse and worse. And so I have to put it aside. And it, it actually makes me feel happy because I have grown as an author. And I don't know if being who I am now, editing it would be, would improve it. Because... I'm not in the same mindset as I was when I wrote it in the first place. So I'm saying I've been there and I did love that series. I, I loved it and wanted to shine it up as best I could to make it, people want it. And it, 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 it turned into wasted time and frustrations and feeling like I'm sitting in the mud, just spinning. And so I'm telling you, like, I know some of you have books you've been working on for years and years and years. And you might look at Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell and think, well, there's an outlier. Yeah, Susanna Clark worked on that for like a decade, I think. And then she sold it. And then it was a massive bestseller and did a TV show and won all the awards. But like I said, that's an outlier. You need to remember that going through your the process of beginning and ending a story and moving on to a new story that's a learning thing that's a learning process learning about fiction that you will not have if you don't move on to another story you'll just learn how to tell the story that, that you want you'll learn how to tell it in a different way and a different another different way but the same story and you got to move on. And I hate playing bad cop, but this is one of those things that I feel strongly about. If you think your idea is awesome and you can't let go, then just put it put it aside, put it in the trunk. That's that's what the trunk is for. Some people have felt that they were not ready to write a certain novel and so they put it aside and picked it up years later and decided to Take it on. And that has work, worked. But, you know, I'm, I want to challenge you. If you do have a book you've been working on for, I'll say, over two years. Let's say over three years, because it can take a beginner many starts and stops to, to get that one book done. But you'll know if you're the person stuck in the mud. You'll know whether you're just editing it over and over and over again instead of writing it. Writing it slowly, that's a different thing. I'm talking about you started it, you finished it, and now you're polishing and polishing and polishing and polishing. And that's just not healthy. It does not make you a better writer. Yeah, that's my thought for today. It's a little tough love, you know. I'm a complete wuss and a pushover and a people pleaser, so I offer you hugs if I have said any truths that hurt you, and if you are in complete denial, then I wish you luck to decide what's best for you. But uh, I'm going to end the show here now. Uh, if you would like to subscribe 
to this or see my other projects like Ditch Digger or any of the books that I write, go to merverse.com. Also available on any podcatcher you can find. Spotify, Pandora, Apple, Google Play, Amazon. Yeah. And then if you want to catch me on Twitch live, I do gaming or AMA or whatever on Mondays at 2. This is all Eastern Time. And I should be writing on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2. I'll be doing Ditch Diggers regularly with my co-host Matt Wallace on Wednesdays at 11, but not tomorrow because I'm boycotting. I'm turning Twitch off in solidarity with the people who've been dealing with the hate raids and Twitch has been offering a lukewarm response. So uh, no streaming tomorrow. But usually Wednesdays I'll be doing this figures 11 o'clock in the morning. Maybe doing some streaming in the late afternoon on Wednesdays, but that that remains to be seen depending on uh, Numbers Ninja's new schedule. So uh, that was me. I think I hit everything. I have a newsletter, all that stuff. Twitter, Mighty Mur, it's all on it's all on the website. So yeah, I hope to see you again on Thursday or uh, next time you download the next episode. And until then, you should be writing. Why do I, do this I Should Be Writing is available to you Why under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Theme music by John Anilio, art by Numbers Ninja, production by Summer Brooks, and hosting by Libsyn. Find all of this information and more at merverse.com. And remember, we can't do this without you. Thanks for your support. Well, I should be writing. I should be working on my Doctor Who. Yeah, I'm sitting home watching Doctor Who.